Pride is a worldly virtue. It's a highly valued commodity in this world. And to define it, we'll we'll say this. Pride is the satisfaction derived from one's own achievements, or it's a deep pleasure derived from qualities or possessions. It's when you're pleased with yourself because of something that you do, something that you have, or something that you are. Pride sometimes is pronounced and overt. We hear a lot of these phrases all the time. For example, we hear a popular one today, gay pride. Pride over something that you have or are or do. That's just an example. But it also, it shows up more subtly in other things too. We hear phrases like, or terms like self-esteem. We hear about a person who exudes confidence or just the, the, the process, the act of popularity seeking. We're addicted to building ourselves up Chasing celebrity, notoriety, respect. And all these things are derived from the sin of pride. Now, sin? You sure this is sin? Well, James 4, 6 that says that God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. He's opposed to pride. He's even at war with pride. Proverbs six sixteen. there are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to Him, guess what number one is? Pride. 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 Well, what does God desire? Ephesians 4, 1 and 2, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Again, number one, with what? With all humility and gentleness. Colossians 3, 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, He says, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving others as the Lord has forgiven you. Philippians 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but again, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Again, an exhortation to humility. So God desires humility from His people. The question is, what does this really look like? Because as soon as you say, well, let me show you what humility looks like, there's a problem with that, isn't there? Let me, let me show you a prime example of humility. Here, watch what I do, right? I mean, you... There's no person who can demonstrate what that looks like. Even even when you buy books, I've actually purchased books on humility, and as soon as you look at the author, you're saying, all right, now is this guy really going to tell me what humility is all about? Is he going to show me? Is this person who's writing this book on humility humble? It's, It's a terrible cycle we get stuck in. And I would argue that many godly believers have written very helpfully on humility. But surely we struggle to find an exemplary model of humility. And that is why we need to look to Jesus as our example. Turn with me to John chapter 13. Now, John chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, they all take place on one night. So we're going to spend a lot of time over the next couple of weeks in this section of three to, or 13 to 17, and it's all going to be centered on one evening. So this is one, uh, we're going to pause the button, so to speak, several times over the next few weeks. This is a Thursday evening. This is the eve of Passover. Now remember where we are in the life of Jesus. This is the last week. He's been ministering for three years, and this is the very last week of his ministry, his life on earth before he's killed. And in the context of these chapters, remember in your mind, he gets killed tomorrow. Tomorrow. But tonight, Jesus and the disciples, they're in Jerusalem. They're at a dining room. It's in actually the upper room. It's upstairs in one of these homes. And they're eating this last supper. And John, who is himself present here, he records an astonishing event in John 13. Look with me. 
Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, A servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now the events of this evening, they go on for, like I said, several chapters, but tonight we're going to stay, or today we're going to stay just in these 17 verses. We're going to examine how this account plays out. We're going to actually look at this in three main points. You can follow along in your outline. It's going to help you just to navigate the text this morning. But number one is the act of service. In typical John fashion, he gives us some introductory information. John's so helpful like that, isn't he? He always gives you a little extra to help you to figure out where you are. Doesn't leave you hanging like the other guys, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. No, he gives you more, which is good. But he writes this here. He says, now before the feast of Passover... So he sets the stage. He says, this is taking place on Thursday evening. Now, some have taken issue with this. Some scholars have looked at this and they've challenged the dating of this, the time of this, saying that these events could not have happened on Thursday because later in chapter 18, the Pharisees, they comment about how they don't want to do anything that's going to stop them from uh, observing the Passover on the next day, which would mean Friday. So is it Thursday or is it Friday? Well, it doesn't really conflict too bad because a lot of history has shown us that the Jews may have observed Passover dinner either on Thursday or Friday. So it doesn't really matter. They could pick one. If you follow the chronology of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these events here, they do occur on Thursday night. So I think it's safe to say this is happening on the Thursday eve right before Good Friday. Now it's at this point that we read here Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Now, for the last few years, Jesus has been saying, my hour has not yet come. He's been saying, my hour is coming. It's almost here. But now, the last chapter 12, he says it too, but here he says, my hour is now. Now the time has come. My hour has come. He knows that whatever is going to happen... The the culmination of the entire life and ministry of his whole work is happening. It's coming to a head now. The hour has come. And John gets very specific. He helps us out. He says, the time has come to depart out of the world and to go to be with the Father. So before, the disciples were a little bit curious. What is he talking about? What hour are you talking about? And John actually gives us some clues and says, he's leaving. He's going to go away. And go to be with the Father. He's going to die on a cross. He's going to return to heaven. 
It's happening now. So John includes this little bit of nuance, a few brief words. And then he records something that sets the tone for the whole evening. And if you read the Gospel fast, you might not catch the nuance of what he's about to say. But he lays out the heart of Jesus with regards to the disciples, but also to all of us, all believers. Jesus, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. Everything Jesus did was for love. Love for the Father. Love for the church. We don't want to gloss too quickly over that. When Paul says, He loved me and gave Himself for me, that's a profound statement. Jesus loved His own. And this is the heart behind everything He does, certainly everything He's about to do in this morning's text. It's all rooted in His love for for us. And then John further sets the scene. He creates tension now because he's introducing another element into this. Look at verse 2. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So now we have another element here. You have Jesus' love and he's ready to, to demonstrate this love. And then we have this wicked evil that's sitting at the table. Now, there's much going on around this verse. We already know over in Matthew 26, we read about Judas, what he's done leading up to that, to that night. In Matthew 26, 14 to 16, we read this, that one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, he went to the chief priests. And he said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver, And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. He had gone to the Pharisees, he had gone to the chief priests, and he said, how much money am I going to get if I give you this person you're looking for? Because remember, all the way back to chapter 5, which is over a year ago in the text, the Pharisees have been looking for an opportunity to get Jesus. And so now Judas is going to play right into their hands. And at dinner, Thursday night, nobody knows that Judas is about to betray Jesus. Nobody knows except Jesus. He tells them during the Last Supper, in another Gospel, one of you will betray me. And the disciples are very sorrowful. They begin to ask, is it I, Lord? He answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of Him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had not been born. He says that at the dinner. And they're curious. They don't know what's going on. And Jesus is telling them, there's a traitor at this table. There's someone who's going to betray me sitting right here who's dipping his food into my cup. But at this time, they don't know who it is. They can't figure it out. But John, who is remembering back as he's writing this Gospel, he remembers back to that night and he records what they later came to find out. That even then, while Judas was sitting at the table, the devil had already put it into his heart to betray Jesus. And Jesus knows this. And the disciples, they're they're oblivious. They don't know But the question now is, with all this going on, what's the discussion? What are they talking about? Well, Luke actually records some of the conversation that's taking place. I'll just read these to you. This is all the same night. A dispute also arose among them, the disciples, as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is greater, one who reclines at the table, or the one who serves? 
Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I'm among you as the one who serves. So that's the context. They're arguing about status and notoriety. They know they're part of something really spectacular. They they know that something's coming. But instead of thinking about the glory of God, they think about their own glory. And they start to even bicker over it. Can, Can you imagine that? Just sitting here arguing about which one of us is the best. That's what they're doing. Which of them is going to be the greatest in God's kingdom? And then Jesus, he throws a rock through their understanding. He says, who is is greater? The one who reclines at the table and has kind of the place of honor? Or the one who serves? Which one's greater? He's asking them. And while they're chewing on that, we read this back in John. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands, that He'd come from God and was going back to God, He rose from supper, laid aside His outer garments, taking a towel tied around His waist, and then He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around Him. Now let's talk about this. In the Middle East... First century A.D., people, they wore sandals everywhere they went. That's the only way to, to do it, and the only place to get where you were going to go was to walk. If you, were, had, if you had more money, you had a, a horse or possibly a camel, but for the most part, you walked everywhere you went. All the roads were designed for people just traveling on them. So every day, all day long, people just walked around, and naturally their feet got dirty. If any of you have ever been outside in the garden or at the beach, you know after just a couple of hours, your feet are just filthy, right? So their feet would get very dirty, disgusting even. So bad, in fact, that they would have to be washed constantly, constantly, especially at mealtimes, because you don't want to have to sit there through dinner smelling everybody else's dirty feet. Nobody, that's not appetizing to us. It wasn't appetizing to them. And so every time they would go and sit down, they would have to have their feet washed every single time. And the job of washing their feet always fell to the servants. This was a a low and degrading job, getting all the stuff out of their feet. And I won't describe to you because you know. But this job, this was so detestable, in fact, that even the Jews, they didn't even allow their Jewish servants to wash their feet. A lot of times they would reserve this disgusting job for their Gentile servants, their non-Jewish servants, the people they regarded even lower. And this gives us some perspective when we actually think about John the Baptist, his words, when he says, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal." He says, I'm not even worthy to do the job of a Gentile slave in comparison to how glorious Jesus Christ is. That gives you an idea into his humility. By the way, Jesus also says he's the greatest person ever born. That's the kind of humility. That wasn't a platitude. That was just a, I mean, he had that kind of humility. I'm not even worthy to get down and untie the sandal to wash his dirty feet. So at this dinner, apparently nobody had even bothered to do this. Maybe the servants didn't show up, or maybe they didn't have anybody there who was willing to do it. And in the midst of them sitting there with these disgusting feet, they're arguing about which one of them is the greatest. Because you know they're they're probably saying, hey John, you're the youngest, why don't you wash our feet? No, Jesus said I'm the one who's loved, and they probably thought about this. So they're arguing about which one is the greatest. And meanwhile, there's this Odor coming up from the table. And while they're, dis- they're arguing about which one of them is the greatest, Jesus gets up from the table and he proceeds to do the degrading, humiliating work of a Gentile slave. He washes all of their feet, even Judas. How do they respond to this? Well, they respond with astonishment. 
Look at number two, the answer to Peter. The answer. Now, if any of the other disciples had said anything, John doesn't record it, but he does record Peter's response. Verse 6. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Now, the emphasis on the Greek is on you and on my. So he's totally astonished. He's bewildered. It's saying, Lord, what are you doing? Are you going to wash my feet? What, what are you doing, Lord? Don't you realize that's not for you to be doing? He's their Lord. He's their rabbi. He's their leader. If anybody at the table was absolved from doing this work, it would have been him. And certainly it would have been shameful for them to see their teacher, their Lord, on his feet, on his knees, without his clothes on, with just a towel around his waist, washing their disgusting feet. That's got to be not only humiliating for Jesus, but humiliating for them. Certainly this is shameful. Verse 7, Well, Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. It's just another thing that the disciples don't quite get yet. Lots of those, aren't there? They won't have full understanding until later when the Holy Spirit comes and indwells them and gives them understanding and illumination. But obviously, Peter misunderstands what's going on because he protests. Look at verse 8. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Now on the surface, this seems kind of noble, doesn't it? He acknowledges that Jesus is worthy of more credit than what he's taking on. He he really has no business doing the work of a slave. This seems admirable at first glance. But listen to how Jesus responds to him. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. That cuts like a knife. What does he mean? What does he mean? Well, we can really see this sentence two ways. We can can kind of take this with two understandings here. Let let me explain. The first is this. The act of foot washing, even though it was humiliating, this was a much needed service. This wasn't just disgusting for the sake of disgusting. It was a needed job. There's lots of jobs in the world that are dirty and disgusting but have to be done to keep us going here. And so the person who is receiving this service, this is a a much needed thing, so they're going to be profoundly grateful to the person who's doing it for them, even if that person's a slave. You know that after washing their feet, the person receiving it probably said, thank you, thank you very much, because their feet are now clean. So by doing this, Jesus is extending an act of kindness as a basis for fellowship. You see that? He's offering something to them that's valuable, even more valuable because of who's the one who's doing it, but this is a basis for relationship here. This is a way of placing value on the person who's being served. We sense that, don't you? When someone serves you, even in a small way, you're grateful. And there's a sense in which that your heart, unless it's a stone, is responding to that other person. They do something nice for you and your heart wants to to do something in return. And and Thank you very much. I I really appreciate that. And usually those aren't just words. People usually appreciate when someone does something for them. It's a basis, a a ground level point of fellowship. And so true fellowship is built on humble service and blessing others. It's not all of the relationship, but it's a foundation point, isn't it? Oftentimes, we we really struggle with both ends of this. We struggle to serve others because it means that we have to humble ourselves and degrade ourselves to a point, to a place that's that's less than comfortable for us. I don't really want to do that job. And we would never say that's beneath me, but our hearts are saying that's beneath me. We know, people, we know, right? So we don't want to degrade ourselves. But we also struggle on the opposite end where we don't want to receive the blessing of others' service because it's awkward. 
it's a, it puts you kind of in their debt, we think. I owe you one. No, you don't. <laughs> we have a hard time receiving this. We don't like the idea, especially as New Englanders, we don't want anybody waiting on us. I don't want you to do... Th- I can do my own thing. So we have a problem with this. Let me tell you, church, both are rooted in pride. Too proud to serve, too proud to receive. It's pride. But we need to see that there is a blessing and a joy surrounding both of these things. Profound blessing and joy. There's the blessing of giving to others, serving others, without any expectation of receiving anything in return. When you just do something and and you genuinely just care about the person, I I don't want anything. Don't pay me, don't thank me. I just want to I just love you. I just want to serve. That's that's a that's a, a blessed thing. That's a joyful thing. God desires those who serve and give cheerfully, right? We've seen this before, we've we've studied this before. We don't want to do anything out of compulsion. What what kind of service is that? Yeah, I'll serve you if I have to. Here we go. That's not service. That's terrible. But there's also the blessing in allowing others to serve you and to give to you. And I'll tell you, that's humiliating sometimes. People know that you're down. If they know that you're hurting. If they know that you're in need of help. And they come and they offer, they give to you, they serve you, they bring you things, they bring you food, they give you money, they bring you service, they rake your lawn, whatever it is. We have a hard time accepting that. It kind of knocks us down a couple notches, doesn't it? We think we're something else until we get hurt. Or we run into trouble. Physical trouble, financial trouble, emotional trouble, whatever it is. We think we're so great until something happens and then someone comes over and blesses you and you say, thank you. But if you turn it down, if you put up resistance, you're actually depriving others of the opportunity to express love to you and you're robbing them of the joy and the blessing of giving and serving. Ever think about that? That when you put up a wall or a barrier or you refuse, that you're actually stealing from them. You're not being noble in, in refusing a gift. They're hurt. Because they're not doing it because they want you to have some kind of a mutual exchange. They're doing it because they love you. And they care about you and they care about the glory of God if they're a believer. And so by turning it down, you're saying, I don't want your love, thank you. I can, I can take care of myself. In one sense, that's what's Peter, what Peter's trying to do here. He's refusing Jesus' service, and what he's actually doing is refusing his fellowship. He says, Lord, don't wash my feet. Ouch. Jesus is demonstrating love, and Peter is rejecting it. He says, Jesus says in response to him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Which brings us to the second way to see this statement. Not just fellowship, not just service, not just love, but something else. We have to look at the theme here. In the Bible, washing, cleansing, bathing, these are oftentimes ceremonious symbols for spiritual cleansing. In the Old Testament, when someone would go and they would do a ceremonial cleansing or they would wash, it wasn't just for hygiene, they were doing it as an act, a a symbol that they were being cleansed spiritually. They were confessing of their sins, they were washing. It's a symbolic thing. So to be cleansed from sin means to be forgiven from sin and have its lasting stains removed. There's a spiritual aspect to this as well. So Jesus is saying, if I do not wash you, cleanse you, sanctify you, there is no possible forgiveness for sin, and you have no share in my kingdom. That's what he's saying. 
You're talking about how great you are, which one's the greatest in my kingdom, but if I don't cleanse you from your sin, none of you are going to end up even going to my kingdom. You see that? They're way off base. They're way off base. But Peter here, he seems to start catching the meaning of this, and so he does a very human thing. He reverses his position. Look at verse 9. Peter, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Lord, if you're talking about what I think you're talking about, then don't just wash my feet, wash my whole body. You see the switch now? He's getting it? We understand this, don't we? <laughs> this sense that we want God to just clean us out. We get to a place, maybe we do something, or we have a bad day, or a bad week, or a bad year, whatever it is. We have a bad time. We go through a season of of trial and we just know we're in sin. And sometimes you just get so sick of yourself. And you say, Lord, just just cleanse me out. Start over, please. Wash me. Wash me. I've got all this junk. Wash me out. Clean me out. And there's, there's even a trend that's growing in the church that's kind of born out of revivalism where people, they fall away from God for a season and they come back and they're in a, an extremely emotional state and they rededicate themselves to God over and over and over again. I've actually heard of people who've been baptized three, four, five times. Over and over and over again. They recommit their life to God ten or twenty times. I'm not talking about repentance, by the way. I'm talking about this this redo. Let me ask you a question. How many times does Christ need to save you? Once. Once for all. His death is sufficient to cover all of your sins. All of them. Jesus responds... The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. He's completely clean. You see that? He uses two different words here in the Greek, luo and nipto. Luo means to bathe your whole body. You're you're going for a big, huge soak in the tub. Immersion, it's it's whole, whole body cleansing. That's a different word than nipto, which is to cleanse only one area of your body, to wash your hands or your feet or something like that. And so here, to be bathed is to be saved. Regeneration. Being born again. And he says you don't have to do that over and over again. If you're bathed, you're clean. It's done. You don't have to keep on doing it. In ancient days, people would go to a public bathhouse and they would wash and they would come home. And on the way home from getting a bath, they would walk and their feet would get dirty. And so when they would get to their house, they'd have to sit down and just wash their feet and they're good to go. They didn't have to go back to the bathhouse and rebathe their whole body just because their feet are dirty. That's what Jesus is referring to here. He's talking about sanctification. A growth in Christ's likeness. He says, when you walk, when you live, day to day, your feet are going to get dirty. You sin. And when you do, you need to go and get your feet washed. You need to confess your sin before God. How often? That's always the question. How often should I confess? As often as you can. (laughs) How often do you wash your hands? Hopefully before every meal. That's what they tell us when we're kids, right? How often do you brush your teeth? At least once daily. How often do you shower or bathe? Well, whenever you're dirty. We, we, culturally, we don't just go months and months and months without doing these things, right? Let me ask you, how often are you confessing your sins to God? Do you go months and months? Are there things in your life that you have never confessed? If you don't confess your sin, you're letting it build up. Then you have the opposite problem of the person who goes and thinks they have to keep on getting saved over and over again. Then you have the problem where you say, well, I've already taken a bath. 
but you never ever wash your feet. And over time, what happens to your feet? They become calloused. The dirt becomes ingrained. And over time, medically, it can actually become toxified. And if infection happens, it can get into your whole bloodstream. If it gets into your bloodstream, what happens then? You die. Paul said, if you are living according to the flesh, you'll die. But if, by the Spirit, you are, ready, present tense, putting to death, putting to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. If you're confessing your sin, if you're not allowing sin to take a foothold and stay there, if you, do, if you don't do that, if you're confessing your sin, walking in Christ's likeness, he says, then you'll live. Because regenerate Christians, they confess. We don't let sin just build up like plaque around our hearts. We confess. Confess often. As often as you sin, confess. We see this beautiful picture in Titus chapter 3. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. When you get saved, you are washed by Christ. You don't need to get bathed over and over again. But let me tell you, believers, whenever your feet are dirty, clean them. Clean them. How do you do that? You go to the cleaner. You go right to the person who can do it. Because you can't do it on your own. You can't atone for some kind of sin. That's what the Roman Catholic Church is built on. Atoning and penance. We can't do it. God says in Isaiah, your righteousness is filthy rags to me. Disgusting rags, garments, they're disgusting. I don't want your righteousness. I want Christ's righteousness in you. That's what I want. He says, you guys are clean. You're clean. But then he adds, but not every one of you. Verse 11. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. See, for Judas, his pithy little confession, it didn't mean anything. Because he had never been born again. He never trusted in Christ for salvation. He resisted. He betrayed Him. And Jesus calls him unclean. Unclean. All those who are without Christ are unclean. Not just ceremonially, I'm talking about deep disease of sin. We need to be cleansed by God through Christ. Judas was unclean. So Jesus washes their feet, and then He explains. Number three, the attitude of humility. The attitude. When He had washed their feet... And put on his outer garments, he resumed his place, and he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? Now see, they're sitting there dumbfounded. They're totally, they don't know what just happened. And the Lord, he follows up to instruct them. He always did this, didn't he? Anytime he performed a miracle of any kind, he would always give a a message after. He would teach them a lesson. Now this is not a miracle, but this functions the same way a miracle did. They were just blown away. They didn't understand what they just saw. But the effect, is, the effect is miraculous. He says, do you understand what I've done? And they would have said, no. And so he says, verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do this as I have done for you. Notice what he does here. I mean, Jesus, he's a brilliant communicator. I mean, beyond being Lord, Savior, God of the universe, just, just the way he talks and reasons is astounding. 
philosophically, he's amazing. He reasons this way. He argues from greater to lesser. He points out the obvious. You call me teacher and Lord, don't you? And they would have said, yes, Lord. Yes, teacher, right? You call me teacher and Lord. These are, these are in Jewish culture, these are, are titles of honor. These are, at the very least, they, they esteemed him highly. He was their superior. And so if Jesus, the teacher and the Lord, could stoop so low to the place of a Gentile slave to serve them, his subordinates, here's the, here's the, the rationale, then how much lower should you go? You see that? If I'm Lord, teacher, God, and I'm doing this, how farther should you go? In your service, in your humility, to follow His example. I want you to notice two things here about this. Number one is the fact that Jesus is setting an example. Now some in church history have seen that Jesus is giving the church another ordinance that by doing so we now have baptism, the Lord's Supper, and foot washing. And some churches actually practice this. But he's not really doing this. In fact, foot washing is only mentioned in one other place in the New Testament in 1 Timothy 5.10. But rather, he says, this is an example of what it means to humble yourself and provide a service to someone else in order to bless them. This is just one example. It's almost as if he's saying, in this moment... This is the lowliest thing I can do. I'm just going to do it to bless you, to illustrate to you how you are to love and serve one another. So particularly, this this is a service that you're not going to get recognition for. This is a lowly task. That's, That's the nature of it. Let me give you a for instance. When you sign up each week to go and clean the bathroom downstairs at the church, that's that's a that's at the level of foot washing. It doesn't have the same stigma. But that's the lowly kind of service. Nobody cleans the bathroom to get glory. Nobody. That's not a a glory kind of a thing. That's pure service. That's what he's talking about. The second thing he he notes here is, is the subject. The recipients of this service. Who are they supposed to be doing this with and to? He says, you also ought to wash one another's feet. He's talking to the disciples, the church, Christians. This is confirmed later, by the way, in John 13, 35, when he tells the disciples to love one another by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So it's illustrated and proved later on. And there are times, church, when we need to serve those who are outside the body. Those in the community, our friends, our neighbors, our family, those who do not know Christ, we need to serve them. But over and over again, the Bible doubles down on the instructions for believers taking care of other believers. That that is given primacy in Scripture. Over and over again. Read the book of Titus. It's all about serving one another for the sake of edifying the body and also bearing witness to the gospel of Christ. He says, Paul tells Titus, he says, You're, by doing this, this behavior, he's referring at that point to slaves, workers, but he says, by doing all these things, you're actually making the gospel beautiful and attractive to other people. When they see how much you serve each other, they go, what is that? I've, I've never seen that before. Why do you love each other so much? Because Christ first loved us. And he loves you too. You see the difference here? There's a profound importance on serving the body. So many churches, I fear, miss this. We become just community service groups who just do everything outside and never service the body. We're we're actually missing out on the point. Again, it's good to serve others. We need to do that. Our witness depends on it. But it's also imperative that we love and serve each other. We have to. This is the basis of koinonia, fellowship. Jesus says if we do this, unbelievers will see that we belong to Him. It's witness. Who's this example? Who's this model? It's Jesus. Verse 16, 17. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them.
We can't see Jesus doing something and then decide that we're above it. We have to be like Him. We have to emulate His his character, His actions, His quality. He's not just Savior and Lord. He is, but He's also our model. We are to be like Him because He is the exact representation of the nature of God. But the question there becomes, why did Jesus do this? Why did He humble Himself like this? He's the God of the universe. Surely He could have had all of us serving Him. Why did He do this? Mark 10.45 says, For even the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. But why? Because God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. In Paul's letter to Philippians, he is giving them the instructions. He's talking to this church. He's teaching them. And he's laying on them command after command, exhortation after exhortation. Paul loves to give these big long lists Okay, ready? Here, do all these things. But 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 he goes all the way down, and the church is probably going. Okay, uh, number one, how do we, you know? He gives them all these exhortations, but at a certain point, the human heart says, "Why should I? Why should I? Why should I serve and love and be humble? Why?" Well, Paul gives them the answer. Look at the beginning of chapter two, Philippians two. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Here's the list. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this same mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God to be a a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. In the Greek, that means to make of no reputation, by the way. Emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The most disgusting, degrading way a person could die in that culture was on a cross. Verse 9, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Because of God's absolute hatred for sinful pride, Jesus had to come as the epitome of humility. He had to be humility incarnate, which He was. See, pride says, I don't need God. Pride says, I can can do better than God. Pride says, I am God. But it's that very attitude that got us killed. It's what killed Adam. He believed the lie of Satan that he could become a god. But Jesus, he came to earth and lived in our place so that he could die in our place as a substitute. And He manifested the perfect humility that God demands from us. The standard is not laxed, by the way. God still demands humility. But the problem is is that we can't give it. There are times maybe where we're humble, but we can't satisfy God's perfect requirement. And so, Jesus is my humility. Jesus is is my righteousness. Jesus is my sinlessness. Jesus is my salvation. And when He went to the cross, He took away the penalty for sin. 
He satisfied the wrath of God bearing down on us. And when He died, He died in our place. And by doing that, Jesus is able to come back from the grave and say, now you are completely clean. No more penalty. No more wrath. No more condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Washed. And now He says, come to Me whenever your feet get dirty. And be sure to serve one another in humility. This is a a beautiful picture of love, grace, forgiveness, blessing, service, and humility. And it's here for us to follow. Let's pray. God, thank You for giving us Your Word. God, I want to thank You that You have not changed Your character or Your standard. I want to thank You that Your character is still perfect and that Your demand is perfection, holiness. I know theologically you can't change that, but I'm grateful to You that You don't. And I'm grateful to You that the wages of my sin is death. And the only reason I'm grateful is because I know Jesus paid that price. And that now all the corners of my life and our life, God, that are wretched, can be cleansed. I'm grateful that You punish sin and are willing to chasten us as children, as sons and daughters to refine us, to make us more like You. But apart from Christ, we would be dead. And so I'm grateful to You for sending Your Son to pay for my sin. Lord God, I pray right now that if there's anyone who's listening to me now who has never trusted in You, who's never come to a place where they understand that they have sinned against a holy God, that the wages of that sin is death, eternal death and judgment and a punishment in hell. I pray that today would be the day of their salvation, that they would turn and trust You, confess all their sin to You, and ask to be saved. The Bible says if we confess our sin, that You are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us, wash us from all of our unrighteousness. Jesus, I thank You for being willing and powerful to come and live humbly in our place and satisfy all the righteous requirements of God to be my pardon, to be my righteousness, to be my humility. Thank You. In Spirit of God, we continue to thank You because You are the One who binds the work of Christ to our lives. You are the One whose power regenerates You are the one who seals us and and guarantees that our once for all salvation is good enough. It seals it to us. You are also the one who convicts us of sin and pride. And you are the one who tells our hearts that judgment is coming if we don't repent. So thank you for your ministry to us. I just ask that right now, Lord that all things would be done to the glory of your name, that you would help your church, your bride, to be humble, to serve one another, to live righteously, to bear the fruit of the Gospel in word and in deed, that we would not be ashamed. Thank You for Your profound love, for Your profound gift. We praise You and we thank You. In Jesus' name, Amen.